Welcome to Nappy's More Right Rudder podcast. I'm Beth Stanton, Director of Publications and Editor for Nappy. This is The Writers Behind the Stories, a bi-monthly series on the podcast where we meet some of the authors who write the articles in Nappy's Mentor Magazine. Today's guest is Fred Stahl, PhD. Fred has been a flight instructor since 1992 with more than 3,500 hours of dual given. He is the former chief flight instructor at AOPA, where he managed in-house flight training and pilot proficiency programs. Fred works with both brand new students and already certificated pilots to help them achieve their goals. He has also taught aviation ground school courses in various settings. Fred is a recognized instrument instructor and past contributor to IFR Magazine. He has been a NAPI member for about 30 years and in 2020 wrote his first article for Mentor Magazine, and he's been an active contributor since. Fred recently wrote, There wouldn't be a Mentor Magazine without the balance between how-to technical articles and human interest stories. In my humble opinion, the combination of both elements is what working as a flight instructor is all about. Fred, welcome to the show. Thank you, Beth. Happy to be here. So glad you're here. So we, just so our listeners know, you know, we pregame our conversations a little bit ahead of time, and I purposely did not ask Fred some questions that I'm really curious about, because I think it's kind of nice to kind of get the reaction in real time. So Fred, what is your PhD in? Psychology interesting i was like okay it's going to be either like aeronautical like engineering or basket weaving okay psychology so, so this is closer to basket weaving yeah listen i was a psych major for my undergraduate so yeah, for you. yeah, yeah. well actually this is really fascinating because with that information see now see you guys it's like this is real time this is real stuff here this informs some of the content that you've written for Mentor. It does have a very um, kind of human factors approach. So how do you go from PhD in psychology to renowned flight instructor? My psychology work was was not in the clinical realm um, at all. It was more kind of academic and research. And you kind of hit a little bit of the nail on the head a bit ago when you said human factors. Um, so I was in a field that uh, is uh, referred to as environmental psychology, which is a kind of a cross, but which involves human factors work as well as uh, um, as well as social psychology and and, and so forth. So um, I think I think uh, my 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 interest earlier in life included teaching, and I have a little bit of university teaching background way back. Um, and I think I think I think when I when I uh, became a pilot a little bit later on, and got into a flying club, and the need arose in that flying club for for a flight instructor, um, something clicked, and I said, you know, I uh, much as I much as at that particular stage, I kind of had the idea that well, flight instructor, man, I'm like, that's one notch below God, and I'm not there. So, As most flight instructors, I'm sure, would concur with you on that so, point. Absolutely. So, you know, gee, I don't know. And, and, uh, but, but, you know, giving it some thought for a day or so, you know, I said, yeah, you know, I bet you I could, I, I bet you I could give that a shot. And so, um, yeah. So, uh, um, I think, uh, it's not so much a leap from psychology to flight instructing, but, um, the, t the two are steps in a journey. Mm -hmm. How's that? I love that. So one of the steps in your journey, in in my opinion, is pretty darn impressive. How does one become chief flight instructor for AOPA? Ah, well, so you'll um, you'll be very impressed by this one. So um, a while back, I uh, retired from my non aviation day job career in the IT industry <clears throat> and um, uh, made a, made the kind of geographic move from North 
North Carolina, where I was living at, at that time, up here to Frederick, Maryland. Um, and that was a move based on family considerations, had a new granddaughter. We wanted to be closer to family and all that great stuff. And uh, so I figured, gee, you know, um, if I'm going to be in Frederick, Maryland, which is where AOPA is headquartered, uh, you know, it would be kind of a shame if I didn't at least try to get some kind of work over there. And um, and I had always, uh, um, you know, had a kind of an eye on the, their their uh, pilot information center. And, uh, you know, from time to time as a flight instructor and as a pilot, I would call those guys with a question of one kind or another, and they were usually quite helpful. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure quite a number of NAFI members know exactly what I'm talking about. <clears throat> and so I figured, you know, what a, what a great gig for an old retired guy a pilot to go work in the pilot information center and sit on the phone all day talking to pilots. I mean, you know, it's like dying and going to heaven, right? Before I, before I knew it, I had a couple of job offers over there. One of which was for, uh, for the chief flight instructor in the flight operations department, um, which was actually a kind of a, not exactly a newly created position. I think it was a resurrection of a position that maybe once upon a time had had kind of uh, fallen between the cracks. And I said, yep, I can, let's, long story short, let's, let's do this. And so, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I went from just being retired and waking up late in the morning to, to um, thinking I was going to be sitting on the phone talking to pilots all day long to actually going over there and and flying and teaching people how to fly. Well, you know, they just don't, I'm sure just, they don't hire, hire just any chuckleheads over their AOPA. So, well, it sounds like over the course of your career, you've had lots of different experiences as a flight instructor. So mm -hmm. um, your stint at AOPA after you retired, you uh, spoke, taught ground courses, which I would actually like to talk to you about, because I think this is an um, element of flight instruction that doesn't really get a lot of highlight. Mm -hmm. And one of the articles that you wrote, which was in the July, August issue of 2023 was from the ground up, putting your ground instructor certificate to work. Right. So in that story, you told the, you shared with NAFI members, how when you first became a CFI, you're like, hey, let me put this to use. Let me get some experience. And you came up against some walls as you attempted to do this. So tell us a little bit about why did you do the ground instructor and ground instructor and why do you think other people could potentially teach ground school courses? Sure. So um well. First of all, having having an interest in doing ground school uh, stems probably from just a, a, a deeper interest in in teaching. OK, um, and so uh, so I guess I, I had and I had a little bit of background walking in, walking into in through that door uh, uh, as from a from a teaching perspective. And so um, uh, it's not it's it's not to, it's not to say that. You know, gee, I woke up one morning and let's teach ground school. So, um, but having having already been a pilot at that point in my life, maybe for four or five years, whatever that number was, and um, uh, knowing at that point that I think I was probably going to be moving toward the direction of becoming a flight instructor. Uh, you know, and talk and talking to other flight instructors and kind of figuring out how the whole process works and so on and so forth. I got um, di different views on the whole question of ground instruct in in instructing. You know, these kind of range from between, well, uh, ground school is very important. And, you know, usually c CFIs are quite, are quite you know, natural fit for uh, teaching ground school. They obviously have the background, they they have the technical knowledge and so forth, and they're instructors already. Um, but, you know, oftentimes it's hard to get CFIs to want to take time out of their 
uh, out of their um, flight training hours uh, to devote to ground school. And so, yeah, geez, it'd be a great idea to have folks who can just kind of devote their time uh, to uh, to teaching ground school and not worry about, well, gee, I'm missing out on, on flight hours. Um, so that was one perspective. And at the other end of the spectrum was, you know, ground school, a big deal. People take a King course or any one sporties course and, you know, nobody much goes to ground school and, and uh, about the only value in it is that, uh, is that you, you'll, you'll get the fundamentals of instructing written exam out of the way, which you're going to have, which you're going to have to take anyway, when you go for your CFI. So, you know, I figured, well, what the heck? I mean, it's not a whole lot involved. Basically, after after studying, there's, you know, there's a ground instructor exam, uh, written exam, and a fundamentals of instructing exam. Didn't seem very, very painful. So I went out and I got it and I did it. And um, and then I figured, well, OK, I'm, you know, I've, I've, I now have the fundamentals of instructing under my belt. So what the heck, I'll just kind of sit tight until I'm ready to start working on my CFI. Um, then it kind of dawned on me that, well, you know, uh, I've, I've got this capability. Um, there's, 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 there's gotta be a market out, out, out there to use it. And so, um, uh, you know, after a little bit of, uh, knocking on doors and this, that, and the other thing, uh, you know, you kind of say, well, you know, what about the local community college? And so, uh, sh sh sure enough, uh, they had, uh, they, they, they had a private pilot ground school, uh, but they already had someone teaching it and, you know, thanks for your interest. <laughs> um, and so that wasn't going to work at least not in the immediate term. And so, um, I, uh, um, when knocking on some other doors, and I found out that uh, you know uh, you could you could you could probably go to your your local high school, and they may have a adult education program that takes place in the evenings at the high school, and uh, you know, and if they do, maybe you can get on their or you can propose a course and get in their course catalog, and if you get you know more than X number of people signing up, you've got a grad school. You've got you've you've got a course, and so uh, we gave that a try, and actually that worked. Um, and so uh, I managed to do you know a couple semesters worth of that type of thing. And the benefit for I I hope there was a benefit to the students who attended. The benefit for me certainly was um, as it is with with teaching and instructing. Always uh, you learn so much through teaching. Uh, learn from your students. You learn just from uh, preparation for each lesson, and so on and so forth. And uh, and that was a, for me, at least anyway, was a fabulous experience. And in the many years since, uh, wherever I taught flying, and I lived in different parts of the country, and and you know, uh, taught flying, and you, know, you know, pretty much wherever I lived. <clears throat> um, you know, I always, I always found a time, and I always found a mechanism through which to all to also teach ground school. Uh, oftentimes, at the very same FBO where we're teaching flying, that was the the most obvious, uh, you know, place. And the uh, the owners were always happy to create. They were always happy about ground schools because it created an opportunity to bring people in the door. Some number of whom would sign up for flight training. Um, and so, uh, you know, it generally worked out well and um, mostly private ground school, but a lot of instrument ground school as well. I had a stint uh, back back in the middle 1990s where I taught part time for a small branch branch office, so to speak, of American Flyers, which is a kind of a, a large operation that has schools in you know many different cities. Um, and they, for a period of, of several years, had a had a, a school outside of uh, Detroit, Michigan, the area where I was living at that time. And, uh, you know, they do ground schools. They do very rigorous ground schools kind of every weekend, these kind of uh, um, uh, test prep ground schools. So, you know, like maybe maybe it was the first weekend of the month was always private ground school. And then the next weekend was instrument ground school. And the next weekend after that was commercial ground school but the fourth weekend of the month 
was the uh, flight instructor was their flight instructor revalidation course, their FERC. And they they had me teach that. And that was a that was a real experience and a half. And so uh, I enjoyed it immensely, but uh, you know, it was 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 grueling. It was uh, another another step in the journey, another another uh, another part of the uh, growth process. Well, is and that's the truth for any endeavor that we sure. undertake in aviation. And uh, I actually have a I have a little bit of a ground school confession to make to you <laughs> and to all the NAFI members listening. So. I took ground school from the adult continuing education through the community college. And I took signed up for the King's <laughs> ground school course and the Sporties ground school course. And then I took another in-person ground school course. So I know that may seem like a bit of a slow learner, but I just want to share this with you. I live in the Central Valley of California. I started flying on December 1st. If you know anything about the Central Valley of California, all through the winter, there's this thing called Thule fog. So <laughs> flight after flight after flight, I got canceled. And I wanted to just start flying and keep flying. But you can't fly with, you know, quarter mile of visibility. So what I did is I said, all right, enough of this. I'm going to just take ground school and pass my written. So I literally took this ground school. I knew nothing about aviation. I knew nothing about flying. I literally memorized everything with zero flight experience context to put it into, memorized it, passed my written with flying colors. And then I started flying June 1st, literally six months later. Mm -hmm. And as I'm flying, I'm like, oh, that's what that meant. And oh, that so it was so interesting to take ground mm -hmm. school with zero context. Yeah. So I don't necessarily recommend doing it that way, but it was, there was repetition. So then there were things I didn't understand, like um, navigation. I had a hard time with that. Mm -hmm. And um, there were some other things I had a really hard time with. So I would watch the King School videos, then I'd watch the Sporties videos, and then I'd look at YouTube videos. Weather was the other hard thing I had. So then about a year went by and I'm getting ready to take my check ride. And that's when I took ground school again, literally in person again, because it was, I figured it would be like a review. Sure. So, so it was like your fourth time was a charm, right? So um, it, it was, it really got hammered home. So I tell all this to let you guys know that I'm sure people listening, if you've ever thought you weren't the brightest bulb in the marquee, I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> there might be one that's a little dimmer, but, um, you know, I'm not ashamed of it. It's just, I, I learned through repetition. So here is sure. my question to you, Fred, and you brought this up at the beginning of you talking about the ground school instruction. People can literally read a book. They can watch videos. They don't have to take ground school in-person classes. However, for myself, as a visual learner, as a person who likes to bounce ideas back and forth and ask questions, it was very valuable for me to do this as opposed to just reading a book. Right. So tell me a little bit about those two different approaches. Right. So um, there's another nail you've, you've hit on the head for us. Uh, so, you know, the, the reality is, and whether it's flying or, or pretty much any other endeavor, uh, you know, different people learn in different ways. There are many different learning styles, if you will. Uh, and there are visual learners and there are book learners, so to speak. And there are people who, uh, if you can't, if, you know, if you, if they can't touch it and feel it and turn it and twist it, they're not going to learn. And so, uh, the ch the challenge, well, yeah, in a sense, the challenge is to, you know, is to, well, the challenge for any individual is to find the learning mechanism or mechanisms that work best for you. And that, you know, that you, you may not hit that one on the first try, right? So it may take, let's, you know, ground school may or may not turn out to be your thing. Um, uh, but video course might be. 
you know, or vice versa, or may, or maybe, right? In uh, perhaps in the, uh, your case being a great example, um, a combination of of all of the above. I um, I have I have done uh, ground schools where you know it just the people enroll and they come and you don't you don't necessarily know who's going to end up flying eventually and eventually could be in another month or three months or or two years and if it's once it gets beyond you know a certain point of time period of time away from ground school you know what it, it's it's nice it's nice that they came to ground school and participated but what what have they what have they really retained from it and so on and so forth and i've taught in those environments where uh, you know, okay, we're at, we're at, we're at the we're at the flight school at the airport. We're flying we're we're flying with folks during the day, as it were, uh, and we are uh, and maybe they're participating in ground school in the evening, and the ground school more or less meshes with their flight training in terms of uh, you know se the sequence of of uh, of lessons and so forth. Um, in which case, you know, my my thought has always been that that kind of integrated ground and flight training is better um, for most folks. Okay. Um, on the other hand, you know, I mean, there's a there's a there's a tradition, and I'm sure I'm sure we still see it out there, particularly among among perhaps the older set of uh, independent flight instructors. Who, um, when approached by a new student, uh, maybe the first question the flight instructor asks, well, "Have you have you passed in the have you passed your knowledge test yet?" And the answer might be, "What's a knowledge test?" Right. And so, uh, um, you know, th there are instructors out there who uh, perhaps who who still don't they don't want to start flying with you on, on until you've presented a certificate of completion of your knowledge test, and. Uh, Th that that was never my style. That's not my thing. Uh, if I could, if uh, on those occasions when I've worked as an independent and I've taken on a new student um, and I've encouraged them perhaps to, uh, you know, do a sporties course or a king course or whatever, whatever worked for them. Um, and I would encourage them to do that. But at the same time, we would we would make you know, we would make sure to meet on those uh, on those days where we're weathered out to do ground school and ground school that that is focused obviously on the particular flight lessons that we're working on, but the more general topics is as well. So whether it's weather or uh, aerodynamics or system aircraft systems and so forth. Um, just, just, just so that I, you know, I, I always wanted to have sort of my hands in their uh, knowledge acquisition, as well as their skill acquisition, to the extent that we were able to do that. And well, that, uh, you know, that makes a lot of sense. And that's like being a well-rounded instructor, right? You know, you do, you want to have all the different pieces meshed together because flying is more than just knowing things. And it's of more than just the kinesthetic skill of flying. You have to integrate those those things yeah. together. Absolutely. You know, it's it turns out to all be all be very comp very complex. Uh, and uh, you know, sometimes I look back on myself and I say, "Wait, you you actually did all that stuff? <laughs> Nobody can do that stuff." But I, yeah, wow. it's it is kind of amazing when you like look back and you think of just just how complicated this endeavor is and and it's constantly changing and then of course staying proficient uh, you yeah. could you could learn something 10 or 20 years ago but that doesn't mean you're going to be able to do it today and so yeah. that's that's part of what's so important about organizations like NAFI and absolutely continuing the the knowledge staying uh, abreast of the latest developments as well as keeping your skills polished and so Obviously, one of you know the, the I have my finger in the the pie of publications and, and publishing articles to help instructors learn and continue to learn and learn from each other. So, Fred, 
when we spoke a few weeks ago, you told me that I believe you said you, you've been a member of NAFI for about 30 years. And I believe you said you joined as soon as you passed your flight instructor check ride, you went and joined NAFI. <laughs> exactly. So, so you joined NAFI quite a while ago. And your first article that you wrote for Mentor Magazine was in 2020. So my question to you is, <laughs> what was your impetus to decide to want to start contributing to Mentor Magazine? Mm. Right. So, yeah, that was a little bit of a time gap there, uh, uh, granted. And no judgment, <laughs> uh, Fred. I'm not saying you should have ponied up sooner. I just, so I I'm could, curious because I could say stuff lasts. like, well, I, I could say things like, oh, I was real busy. And, you know, with, um, so in, in my case, right. So I felt I came to a certain point in life, a certain stage, a certain age, uh, where um, it was it was it was a time for me to make sh make sure that um, I was still doing what I could to give back and to uh, impart whatever pearls of wisdom um, or or experience really um, to the new people coming up to a new generation. Um, as cliche-ish as I'm sure that probably sounds to a lot of people. Um, and uh, I thought that, uh, well, I, I, I knew that NAFI uh, uh, and, and, and Mentor specifically, you know, was the right mechanism to do that. I mean, what were my options? Yeah, I could, I could do a memoir. Uh, in fact, let's, we could almost uh, kind of test out a uh, kind of a, maybe a title here. I was thinking maybe um, CFI Confidential, right? Sub subtitle, uh, you know, uh, stories ripped from the pages of a flight instructor's logbook, you know, something like that. I want to see this book, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, <laughs> but, but, uh, but in the real world, uh, uh, not, you know, writing for mentors seemed, seemed to be a, you know, probably a, a real, you know, primary way to um you know to get some thoughts and uh and experiences out uh to folks who could um you know maybe benefit from that sort of thing and my uh, i'm not sure style is the is the right terminology here but my my general approach is to try to write stor stories that are from my own experience uh actually sort of torn from the pages of my logbook as it were uh but but do but 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 do it in a way that poses the qu the question um you know put put yourself in put yourself in my shoes how how would you have responded what would you have done you you might you might not have you know it might not have work, worked out or you might not have responded the way i did and that's okay i mean i managed to live to talk about it so to speak and and you will too, um, uh, but uh, I I think there's a lot of learning um, and growth and development that goes on by by trying to um, look at uh, look at another person's experiences and try to kind of you know walk in their shoes a little bit and try to figure out how you might have you might have. Uh, reacted in a similar situation. Well, I love this. This is a perfect segue, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> so what what I'm hearing, first of all, it's not just to tell somebody something you you want people to think for themselves, like what would what would I have done or um, present a scenario or a situation or circumstance that maybe they've never had before, like, oh, hadn't thought of that yeah. one. But this is what this yeah. is what Fred did. So one of the things that you said recently, Fred, was, I'm going to read it because you wrote this actually to me, and you said to me, the techniques and technicalities type of articles are essential, but at this point in my life, it's the personal stories told by fellow flight instructors that deliver the most impact for me. So tell us a little bit about 
what hearing those, what is the impact of these personal stories? What do they have on you? Uh, uh, stories of others. Yeah, you you were talking about a, f- a few stories, and in particular, one was um, a, a, stu- a story that Julia Harrington wrote about becoming a student again, mm-hmm. and Patrick Howell wrote about um, helping one of his students um, in in the B fifty two and um the instrument approach like how music is like flight training so you were saying that you found those those were more sort of personal interest stories they weren't like a this is how you do blank but it was um you called their stories fascinating you thought you just thought it was interesting so what is it about um hearing these personal interest stories that that is impactful for you uh yeah i mean i i think it's i think I think they create they they created for me a an almost personal connection mm. with with the with the authors and and I could I could almost uh visualize myself in a very similar situation in a similar scenario uh and uh it, they're just very absorbing in that in that way uh, well, it's just, um, you know, again, not that not that we have any Pulitzer Prizes, you know, being thrown around over here at NAFI, but, you know, people have really compelling stories to tell. And, you know, flight instruction and flight instructors is, is such a niche, small community that I really do think that sharing personal experiences and not just my student did this or I had this situation, but just like um, the impact that it has being a a pilot, being an aviator, being a flight instructor, um, people wear that not just as a job, but it's an identity and it's an identity that not a lot of other people share. It's, it's, it's a small group of folks. And so it's almost like, we're like a support group for each other, really. No, no, that's, and, uh, that's very well put. Yeah. So with that being said, Fred, for some of our listeners who are out there, who've been NAFI members for a while, who've been reading Mentor Magazine for a while, been reading your articles, been reading some of the other articles we're talking sure. about, and they might be thinking, huh, I might want to share one of my stories what would your advice be to that individual i would encourage them that you know no 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 story almost no story is 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 too trivial that um that probably um probably all of their uh, all of their experiences and stories um can have meaning to Maybe not every other reader, every other flight instructor, uh, every other NAFI member, but but even some of them, um, in such a way as to almost change their life or change their approach to something, um, or um, you know. Take take that next step. Maybe try to do ground school. Maybe maybe try to do aerobatics. Maybe try to stretch yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, um, you know, if I've been able to help anyone in some way, I think you know that's. I think that'd be great. Um, and I would encourage any other prospective writer that they ha- they they have within them. Okay, so they have. The capability and the and should take the opportunity to uh, to share their experiences and their knowledge and their 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 wisdom even uh, with other people who uh, with 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 the community amongst amongst which will be will definitely be some people who will grow from from wearing their shoes for an hour and from their experiences. Well said, Fred. I think I need to have, take you on the road and be my, (laughs) my, no, that's in, 
you know, I'll just add another piece to this puzzle, as as you well know, when prospective mentor authors reach out to me, one of the first things I do is say, let's get on the phone and talk. <laughs> let's, what do you want to write about? Let's sort of sure. dial in an angle that you sure. want to talk about. Some people submit things just because they, they have it on their mind, but other time we kind of game play out ideas. And so there's a, there's support here. It's not just yeah. like write this thing and you're writing it into this vacuum. Like, um, you know, I work with, with the authors, um, this, you know, people who say I'm not a good writer. Well, you can tell a story. <laughs> <laughs> we're all good at hanger flying and writing is just another version of hanger flying. And, you yeah. know, don't worry about not being a good writer because mm -hmm. that is why God invented editors. Uh, <laughs> we make you, we make it, we polish it up. I love it. So, um, so yeah. So Fred, I want to just thank you for, for your contributions to uh, mentor magazine. Um, I think, you know, somebody like you who has, you know, decades of experience uh, under their belt, I will say to the point what you were just saying about learning something new. Uh, an, a NAFI member wrote an article a couple months ago about a new way of teaching night, night flying. Mm -hmm. And a instructor who's been teaching this for a decade was like, wow, I never thought of teaching it that way. I'm going to teach it this way from now on. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, no exactly. matter how long we've been doing this for, we can all learn something. And then um, this gentleman, John Booz, who wrote this article, I don't know, he's just been teaching it this way. And he thought, well, let me share it with Nafi. And everybody's like, oh my God, this is great. Yeah. So, you know, the fact that he thought to reach out and, and take the time and effort to write this article mm -hmm. is really impactful. And again, it doesn't have to be a how-to. It can be telling your story that that's very inspiring. Mm -hmm. And um, like you said, feel a connection. Like, like you yeah. know that person, you walk for, you know, a few minutes in their shoes while, while you're reading the story. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so thank you, Fred, for being part of the NAFI mentor a contributor family. Very much appreciated. Um, before we wrap up today, um, is there anything, tell, tell us about what, what's been the most rewarding part of writing for mentor and being part of this process, not just an observer reading the magazine, but being part of it. Wow. Uh, Seeing my articles in print, I suppose, is not not too bad. I mean, I've I've done a little bit of that before with years ago with IFR magazine, so I uh, understand how how that can uh, how that can really kind of impact you as well. But but um, working with you has been uh, has definitely been a uh, an experience for me as well. Uh, you know, writing I've done in the past, whether it was uh, uh, for IFR. Uh, where I wrote for an, over the course of a number of years, uh, a few of their editors, um, uh, and uh, and you know, years and years of technical writing I had done in you know uh, in a different field. Um, I, I it's un, it's un, it's unusual to have at least in my my experience. It was unusual to have uh, the kind of a uh, relationship with an editor. You know that 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 we've had even there's just been a couple stories at this point, but uh, um, uh, you know I've learned from the process, um, and uh, but again I think the most uh, uh, even more rewarding okay, um, has been just 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 the idea of being able to to kind of get my thoughts uh, and stories uh, out out to a community that uh that i have a huge respect for um that i'm i'm i feel blessed to be able, be able to even be a part of uh let alone for so many years um and and uh and that and that i can i can uh through through mentor a magazine i can i can have the have an opportunity to uh to get out before them Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Fred. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, I like that saying, a rising tide lifts all ships mm -hmm. and we all can help each other. And it's, it's a win-win yeah. and yeah, but in seeing your, seeing your words in print never gets old either. 
<laughs> it's fun. Really, when you go it's from fun. like a, a Word document to a whole entire magazine layout, it, it's a lot of fun. So yeah, it is. Yeah. So um and beside, of course, that ego gratification, like to your point, is it's just all of the the fact that you are giving back. And you said that earlier in the beginning of this conversation when I asked you why did you decide to start writing, you said yeah. it was a way that I can give back to the community. Yeah. So thank you, Fred, for giving back to the community. And I encourage all of our listeners to consider ways that you might want to consider um, sharing some of your stories with. NAFI through Mentor Magazine. And I look forward to reading them. <laughs> thank you so much, Fred. Thank you, Beth. So everybody, thank you for joining us for the writers behind the stories on NAFI's More Write Writer podcast. Be sure to leave your comments, like, subscribe, and join me next time in a couple of months. We'll see you next time on the writers behind the stories on NAFI's More Write Writer podcast.